the theme for this week is uh, the three faces of spirit. And this phrase comes from Ken Wilber. Although, as we've been discussing uh, with Ken Wilber's work, the idea here is that this framework or description is pointing to something in our own experience in the world. Um, and this is one of those ways that could be helpful to understand how we approach awakening, the flavor with which we express awakening, the forms that our practices take. Um, yeah, how we just dis discuss the entire path. And that uh, is obvious when we look at the title, Three Faces of Spirit. So face, what does this face of spirit look like? And as we'll see when we briefly talk about each one, you'll probably quickly be able to identify different contemplative spiritual traditions that really embody each of these faces of spirit. And what I want to do today is just give you a sense of that first in the, the, this talk here, and then in practice afterwards, we'll, we'll have a, an experiential sense of it. But even, even as you listen here, you can check in with yourself uh, in a couple ways. One is to ask the question, what's my experience of each of these faces? So as you hear it being described, does it sound familiar to you in your own practice in life? Or does it sound new, strange, different, unfamiliar? Or do you have a particular reaction to it? Is, or do you have an allergy to a particular face of spirit that you say, mm, that's not my, my bag. This one over here is my bag. So pay attention to that. And also, as I mentioned already, the question that comes up for me is how does practicing an awakening and our embodiment of awakening change with each of these faces of spirit with the different explorations of them? And how does it change how I show up in the world? So sit with these questions as we discuss. So these three faces of spirit are connected to the big three in integral theory, I, we, and it. But here we are talking about ultimate reality. So three faces of capital S spirit and how the, again, how we approach and express ultimate reality. So just a quick review, I refers to my interior. So this is subjectivity. So a very subjective approach to ultimate reality. Second person can be expressed as you or we, depending if we're talking about singular or plural. And, but here we were talking about shared interiors and um, relationship as an approach to ultimate reality. And then finally we have it, which is exterior. So, you know, opposite of the I uh, out there. And Ken differentiates this by referring to these three as great I or I dash I, 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 which also differentiates it from standard everyday self, capital or lowercase s self. So I am talking, I am looking, you know, I, I refers to this ultimate reality experience. Um, great thou for second person. And then great it or great other for the third one. So in, what's interesting is that um, in the fourth turning, or just what the phase we're living through now, we have fairly easy access to all three expressions of these three faces of spirit today compared to say maybe a thousand years ago, right? Um, so we have access to all of these um, practices and traditions, which means that we have the possibility to explore the, uh, each of them, to experiment, to integrate them in our own practice and to see what that is like, what it leads to. So now let's get into a little bit more specifics on each of them. And I'm gonna read some passages that I think embody uh, this, the flavor of each and reference a few practices that you might have heard of. So first with the great I, uh, I want to read a very short passage out of one of my favorite all-time texts Self-liberation through seeing with naked awareness. This is a Sogen text. 
the text itself is very short. It's like 15 pages. Um, it is uh, essentially pointing out instructions, but I'm gonna read you one quick short paragraph. Thoughts in the past are clear and empty and leave no traces behind. Thoughts in the future are fresh and unconditioned by anything. And in the present moment, when your mind remains in its own condition without constructing anything, awareness at that moment in itself is quite ordinary. And when you look into yourself in this way nakedly, since there is only this pure observing, there will be found a lucid clarity without anyone being there who is the observer. Only a naked manifest awareness is present. So, for example, if you sat with that, those instructions over and over, you're going to have a very clear experience of what this face of spirit points to, which is subjective, radical sub subjectivity, radical awareness, only awareness. And uh, some practices that are tied to this or an expression of this, shikantaza, rigpa, just sitting, and also self-inquiry. For example, who am I? Kin's summary of this, which I like, is this. And who you are is pure spirit in first person, pure consciousness without an object, the pure subject, or capital S, self, aware of small subjects and objects, what Zen master Shibayama calls absolute subjectivity, the pure empty subject that can never be made an object or as Madhyamaka Yogacara has it, pure unqualifiable awareness as pure radical emptiness or ultimate freedom, liberation, or release. Now in terms of within this, you can have different flavors. For example, what I read from the Buddhist, so Jin tradition might express instructions that way. Whereas, for example, um, Another flavor, Nisargatada Maharaj. I don't know if you've seen this book. It's very classic. I am that. Well, potentially, and Ramana Maharshi might all point to this same flavor of face of spirit, but one tradition stays away from the word self, like Buddhism. Like, get that out of here. We don't want that self in the room. Uh, whereas in this tradition, might capitalize that capital S self. And of course, that's going to be a different way of practicing, but still, they're both trying to point to radical subjective um, awareness. And to read a quote from Nisargatana Maharaj, awareness is primordial. It is the original state, beginningless, endless, uncaused, unsupported, without parts, without change. And then one from Ramana Maharshi, you are awareness. Awareness is another name for you. Since you are awareness, there is no need to attain or cultivate it. All that you have to do is to give up being aware of other things, that is, of the not-self. If one gives up being aware of them, then pure awareness alone remains, and that is the capital S self. So, I assume that uh, quite a lot of us in this training are very familiar with this particular expression of, of spirit. And now, we'll take a nice right turn into the great thou and see how this feels. And I want to read uh, a brief passage from Khalil Gibran, the prophet. One of my all time favorites, I read it, the first time I read it, read it front to back, one sitting and I cried. And it's one of the most beautiful books I've ever read. So this is technically a book of poetry, but it's more of a question and response to different topics. And this one is, uh, I'm only gonna read part of it, but it's on love. For even as love crowns you, so shall he crucify you. Even as, even as he is for your growth, so is he for your pruning. Even as he ascends to your height and caresses your tenderest branches that quiver in the sun, so shall he descend to your roots and shake them in their clinging to the earth. Like sheaves of corn, he gathers you unto himself. He threshes you to make you naked. He sifts you to free you from your husk. He grinds you to whiteness. He needs you until you are pliant, and then he assigns you to his sacred fire that you may become sacred bread for God's sacred feast. All these things shall love do unto you that you may know the secrets of your heart, and in that knowledge 
become a fragment of life's heart. So for me, that's quite beautiful and I love it. Um, and it's very different from the first face of, of spirit that we discussed. And automatically you can hear in that passage, the differences. So some key words and practices here, grace, love, devotional practice, guru yoga, contemplative prayer, communion, Tonglin, social noting, meta practice, and a very famous text, Dark Night of the Soul, which is a phrase that now shows up quite a lot inside the Buddhist world to refer to those phases of disillusionment. And the reason why we use that phrase is because it so powerfully captures the flavor of that, uh, that tenderness in, in, in that experience. So Kin's description of this spirit in second person is that dimension of spirit that can be approached in a personal living relationship, an I thou relationship quote conversations with God are possible whenever the heart opens to the voice of the ultimate consents the presence of the divine and listens in all humility and openness. So again, this is, a, this is ultimate reality personified. So in this passage, I read you from Cleo Gibran, we talked about love being a person that we're in relationship with and the path is unfolding as a relationship, not as an I practicing seeking in that way. You know, it's quite a bit different. Another quote uh, from Father Thomas Keating, which you, you might've heard that name. Um, he's no longer with us, uh, but he was really pivotal in um, contemplative Christianity and uh, centering prayer as a practice. And his quote is, when the presence of God emerges from our inmost being into our faculties, whenever we walk down the street or drink a cup of soup, divine life is pouring into the world. And I want to share one other passage. This is actually from the Buddhist tradition from this book here, You Are the Eyes of the World. And technically, this is a, a commentary from Longchenpa on another text. And this passage I'm going to read you is spoken at, uh, as Samatha Bhadra in the Tibetan tradition, which is essentially the deity of ultimate reality. And unlike other deities, he's not adorned with anything really. He's just one color, like a bluish color. And uh, sometimes he's in consort with Yab Yum, uh, masculine and feminine consort, to represent ultimate reality. So this is Samatha Bhadra speaking. All that is has me, universal creativity, pure and total presence, as its root. How things appear is my being. How things arise is my manifestation. Sounds and words heard are my messages expressed in sounds and words. All the capacities, forms, and pristine awarenesses of the Buddhas. The bodies of sentient beings, their habituations, and so forth, all environments and their inhabitants, life forms, and experiences are the primordial state of pure and total presence. So this has that flavor of the first text I read, uh, but personified. So that's, it's, it's sort of like a great uh, uh, I-thou relationship there, even in the Buddhist tradition. And of course, guru yoga is very common and popular in Tibetan Buddhism. So we have that there. But you know, uh, the, that passage from Khalil Gibran is quite a lot more bold in terms of the great thou relationship and how we would approach that. And one last phrase to read here, um, this is from Terry Patton from a practice he gave, and it's like the final line of the practice. And that is, allow the grace, allow the humility, allow the awe, allow the surrender. I love that phrase. It's a, that just phrase there is something that could be worked with as a practice to experience this mm, face of, uh, of spirit as great thou. And then finally, it, great it. I had a little difficulty finding some really great quotes, but I have one here from John Muir that I, I really quite liked. And it goes like this. These blessed mountains are so compactly filled with God's beauty. No petty personal hope or experience has room to be. The whole body seems to feel beauty when exposed to it as it feels the campfire of sunshine entering not by the eyes alone, but equally through all one's flesh like radiant heat making a passionate, ecstatic pleasure glow not explainable. One's body then seems homogenous throughout, sound as a crystal. So this passage starts pointing to something. 
practices with nature, uh, the body. So we're moving out into the world as a way to wake up to ultimate reality. We wake up through nature, through the great it of this life. Another uh, quote here is from the Zen tradition, and it's, I imagine it's part of a, a koan, but a monk asked Xiao Shu, what is the living meaning of Zen? Xiao Shu said, the oak tree in the courtyard. I quite like that. So you can wake up through that, the oak tree. Now, uh, some phrases that go with this in practices, great web of life, Indra's net, um, nature practice, God in nature, sky gazing, earth breathing, embodiment practices, the interdependence of the world, planet, universe, cosmos. So that deep interconnection, interconnectivity that permeates the entire world, the entire cosmos, we're tapping into that as a way to wake up. So these are the three faces of spirit in brief, and hopefully that gives you some sense of their flavors. 